Okay, hi everybody, thanks for showing up. Um, I'm actually pleasantly surprised that there are this many people. Uh, maybe you're here for an opportunity to win a free game, but okay. All right, uh, so my name's Colleen. Uh, I'm really honored to be here today, uh, part of this conference in the beautiful city of Prague. So given how late it is, and you know, I hope that I can teach you something new today so you go out of here with some new knowledge and maybe a free game. Uh, so before I go into this presentation, which is gonna focus a lot on data and insights, I do need to set some context around our data philosophy at EA. Um, I guess I forgot to say I work at EA. Uh, so we do take data privacy very seriously. Um, although for my team, having access to good quality player data is important, we do take privacy seriously, and so as part of that, we do allow every player to have the opportunity to opt out of sharing their, their telemetry data. Okay, so to go deeper on what my team does, we partner with the development team, with marketing and the publishing teams at EA, um, and we generate insights to support live services, feature design, as well as business forecasting for EA Sports and competitive gaming. So let's start with some trivia, and uh, I'll give you a chance to win a free copy of Madden, this delightful Hall of Fame edition. Um, so we're going to do this now, and then to get you guys to stay and not just leave after the game, we're going to do the other one in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> okay. So, does anybody know um, one of the top three NFL teams played at the season start? This season? Yes, this season. Uh, one of them. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> okay, you gotta be fast. So one of the top three teams that were played in our game. Yep. Uh, oh, okay. Cancel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so can you pass this? All right, you'll get another chance to win a FIFA later in the presentation. All right. Sorry, I didn't ask that question well. Okay. Do you want to do it again? <laughs> do, do you? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So Falcons is out. Um, can somebody name one of the other teams that were played in the game? Patriots, no. Steelers, yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so they were uh, the Falcons, Steelers, and Cowboys. I was kind of surprised Patriots weren't in there, but. Right, I think people are just getting tired of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, before we start geeking out on data and charts, we're gonna talk about everybody's favorite topic, relationships. So, okay. <laughs> Uh, and there are three stages in a relationship. Um, some people might say four and five, but we'll just say three for the purpose of this presentation. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about the three stages which apply to both your personal relationships as well as the relationships we have with our players. So stage one is the initial attraction phase. You go to a party, maybe similar to the party tonight, um, and you know, you see somebody, your eyes meet across the room, the music starts playing, and so maybe one of you will be courageous enough to go walk over and talk to the other person. And it could end up being a delightful conversation that lasts the whole evening, or it could be a record scratching 10 seconds, who knows. So then, from there, uh, if you're lucky, you enter into stage two of the relationship. Um, we're talking about sweaty palms and that nervousness and yet excitement around dating. Um, so this is the phase where you're going to get to know each other and you're starting to ask the question whether is this the right person for me? Not sure. So for those of you who are fortunate enough to live through the dating phase, you then enter that engagement and commitment phase. Sorry, this 
this is kind of cheesy, but I thought it was really cute, um, which comes with mutual trust and commitment, and you've gotten past that awkward phase, and now you've developed a level of comfort where you're completing each other's sentences, and then this relationship becomes a part of your day-to-day -day life. So you're probably like, where are you going with this? So um, it's kind of analogous to our relationship with the players that the, and the relationship that they have with our games. So if you think about that initial attraction phase, um, you, you remember you saw or you heard about a game and you were so excited to go home and install it or put it into your, your console or PC. Um, so I would make this analogous to that first experience, um, which starts from that initial disk install or, or install. Um, until you complete that guided onboarding. So it's your early sessions. Uh, from there, I would uh, consider the dating phase kind of like your mid-sessions. So that's when you've completed that guided onboarding and you are now kind of, you know, you're on your own, right? So you've gotten through that and now you're on your own to kind of figure out the game. And then the commitment phase, that's the phase where you're now in the flow, you've gained mastery, and you're comfortable with the game. Um, and then the game becomes part of your day-to-day. -day. And so as game professionals, it's on us to provide a fun and quality experience for our players, because that's how we grow our player relationship and get them to continue to come back to play our game. So, um, how do we think of quality time? And so um, usually we measure that in terms of, of game time, which we look at as game sessions. Um, but the thing is, not all sessions are created equal. Um, and in this case, we can't always assume that more is better, um, especially if we're talking about a lot of low quality sessions. And so what we need to do is understand how, how session time is spent. So in EA Sports, every EA Sports game consists of a collection of game modes that encompass different ways to play. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Almost like, almost like a collection of mini games. And so, um, I don't know, how many of you have played an EA Sports game? Oh, good, okay, all right. Um, so if you've played it, uh, you know there's a whole bunch of game modes, and they're almost like games in themselves. There's some casual PvE modes, there's couch play, um, or you can have a more immersive experience where you live out your career as a professional player or coach on your favorite team, or just, you know, PvP modes. And so um, for us, when we're thinking about how time is spent in an EA Sports title, Game modes are a universal dimension for looking at that. Okay, here's the, the geeky stuff coming out. Um, so one framework that we apply uh, is called game mode affinity. Um, and this is a way to segment players based on the relative time spent across game modes. So by doing this, um, you know, we, we can classify people into soloists, duelists, and trios, depending on, you know, are you focused on one mode, two mode, three, three modes, or more? And, you know, we can classify players based on this affinity, and then we'll have like a, a vocabulary for how we talk about our segments, and we can start formulating hypotheses based on the behavior patterns for these different segments. So at a micro level, we can use this game mode affinity framework to understand where the player is at in the relationship phase. So I'm gonna use the next couple of examples to illustrate how game mode affinity works at a micro level. Okay, I love this photo. Um, so you can see here Carl, he's, he's a hardcore gamer. He used to play EA Sports in school with his friends. Like, they would just play it all the time. That was his favorite mode of procrastination. But you can see life has gotten busy for him. Um, now he's a new dad, and he's working, and he hasn't had a whole lot of time to play. And so um, one day, a friend of his gives him a copy of NHL. It's the latest NHL. 
and he finally gets some time to himself, although he's still he's on baby duty. So gets some time to himself and decides to pick up the latest, decides to start playing NHL. He's overly confident because he used to play this all the time, but that was you know more than five years ago. Um, so he decides to jump right into PvP. He puts a disc in the tray. He plays, you know, a couple of training sessions and decides to jump right into PvP. And guess what happened? He had a bad experience. Um, he lost most of his matches, although he kept playing. And what you see here on the chart is um, the x-axis represents the day, like what day. Um, so you know, day one is the first day he started playing, and day two is the second day. And then the y-axis represents the number of sessions. So the orange there is the training he did, and then the gold bars represent all the PVP modes. And so we classify him as a PVP soloist. Um, but the problem is he went in too soon. So he tried to go too far too quickly. And in this sort of situation, what would be good to do is to be able to do these classifications in real time uh, in the early phase. And by knowing that he's new to the franchise, uh, we could do some sort of recommendations in terms of like maybe recommending a more casual PVE experience or some more training. Oh. So this is our, our second person. Her name's Sam. Um, she actually ended up going through all the stages. So Sam is new to Madden, um, and she eased into the experience. So P1 here is phase one of the relationship, um, which is onboarding. Phase two of the relationship, rather than jumping right into PvP, she actually started out with PvE, um, as well, which is in brown, as well as um, some training, which is in orange. You can see here the green bar. She did try PvP once and realized, oh, I'm not ready for that yet, so she came back out. Um, and so then the following year, when the next version of Madden came out, that's her phase three. And so then she did have the confidence in the level of mastery to play more PvP, which is the green bar, the tall green bars here, combined with the red bars, which represent one of our deeper modes in Madden. So I would say this ended up being, you know, a fairly healthy relationship for Sam. So previously we showed two player relationships, um, one that was short and not so sweet, and another that did mature into a longer term relationship. And so the difference is in the quality of their initial experience. So what does game mode affinity tell us about the quality of play? We did some research. So we did some basic exploratory analysis to determine what factors influence engagement. So first we ran some descriptive stats, which isn't shown here, to determine which segments had the highest retention in session days played. So we were able to see those modes that had the highest levels and the lowest levels of engagement. Um, and then we wanted to go deeper to understand how the diversity of game modes impacts engagement. And so what we did find is that players tend to concentrate on one to two of their favorite modes. Um, and that's about 41 and 39% of the population. So, but what we did see was that those who played a variety of modes do tend to retain longer, um, which, which seems obvious. And so, um, you know, what we needed to do was we wanted to dive in to understand the pattern of play, right? So basically, did players start as specialists and then diversify over time, or is it the other way around? Okay, so this is a little bit of a crazy diagram. How many of you actually have, you are familiar with this? The Sankey, di the, the analysts. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay. Um, so this is a Sankey diagram, and this is used to determine the, the movement from point A to point B. So in this case, uh, point A represents the early phase of the product cycle, 
um, for this group of players. And point B on the right represents the end of the product cycle for this particular group of players. So um, we knew that the participation in multiple modes is more engaging for our players. And so I, as I had said, we wanted to see like, how this evolved over time. So what you see on the left here, I wish I had a, a little thing, but please let me know if you guys aren't following. Um, you've got your core mode one purist group, uh, your core mode two purist group, and core mode three purist groups. Oh, thank you. Oh, OK. Uh, OK, here, here, and here. Um, and sorry, I wasn't. I'm not able to share the mode names, so just use your imagination. <laughs> okay, so you've got these groups here, and then the Sankey diagram shows you like they started these groups, these folks started out in this affinity group here, core mode one, two, three, purist, as well as dualists. So dualists are the ones who sp split their time between two different modes. And then you can start to trace their pattern. So you've got a large group here who stay. So they, they stick with that affinity towards the end of the cycle. They're pretty consistent. Um, and then you have some movement. Like you see some folks moving from core mode two into core mode one. So there's some movement there. Um, but you also see here a bunch of dualists and this thick green line moving into purist. So we were seeing a lot of movement. Um, and let's see. So what, so what we did here was then we wanted to see, like, um, was the movement greater from purist to dualists or dualist to purist? And the punchline is that the answer to that question is yes, purists. So players do specialize over time. And purists, as a percentage of the player base, increased by 24 percentage points from the beginning of their cycle to the end of their cycle. And so um, this raised some interesting questions because you know there's a lot of modes in our sports titles. So we then partnered with our UX CI team as well as the, the game designers to understand why this is happening. And it raised some interesting questions and got us thinking about the need to maybe design more integrated experience across our modes to encourage more cross-mode play. Ooh, okay, that was a difficult one to get through. Did that make sense for everybody? Okay, all right. Okay, Oop. yes, okay. So I'm showing the Sankey di diagram again. We're really milking this one. So, um, so the previous one looked at the player journey within one product cycle. We also wanted to look at this between releases. Um, so for those who don't know, in EA Sports, we launch a release every year. So there's you know, FIFA, Madden, NHL. A release will go out every year, uh, which was kind of crazy to me when I first started, but that's what we do. Um, and so we do a lot of year-over-year -year analysis to determine what does something that we do one year, how does that impact the next year? And so one way to use this is to try to figure out what happens with feature investment choices. So given the variety of modes, it's hard to invest in every mode every year. So some years we might um, invest more in a particular mode. And we can use this framework to determine how that choice impacts the, the shifts in preferences across modes. And sometimes, you know, there will be cannibalization theories that come up, right? And people want to know, oh, if we put more investment in this mode, is it going to cannibalize from another mode? So this helps to either invalidate that hypothesis or support it. Okay. So here, uh, for instance, we had a large investment into that mode in the blue area. And what we were able to see was that um, when we did that, there were a lot of folks who stayed in that mode. Um, but we also saw that there were some movement out of the mode. Um, and, okay. and then some movement into the mode. 
And so overall, um, you know, we're able to see the particular engagement shifts, and there's some numbers behind these as well. So if you wanted to see what is the net impact on that blue mode where we put all this investment in, you're able to see that. And you're also able to, you know, invalidate or validate cannibalization theories. Because you can see here exactly, wait a second, if we had a drop in one mode and an increase in other, is that coming from a shift from the dropped mode to the increased mode? So you're able to do all that. Um, also by understanding where players are coming from, it allows you to know, for instance, if somebody came from mode A to mode B, it allows you to design future versions of mode B in a way based on the motivations of those coming from mode A. Okay. All right. So then, um, the breakup, where do players turn? How many of you have asked that question or been asked that question? I think almost everybody. Okay, because that does happen. Um, so we can use game mode affinity to see where players are churning. We don't know why. That, you know, if you want to know why, that's where uh, research like UX and consumer insights comes in. Um, but we can use this to see where it's happening. So, um, so these are some, uh, some frequency charts that we ran. And the different colors represent the different modes. So if we look at the top left here. Oh. Okay, so the, the top left here, this is the game mode affinity aligned to this mode in this weird melon color. Um, and so what this shows is the x-axis is the, the, the session day sequence. So, so this is the, the, your first session, your second session, your third session, and so forth. And then the y-axis represents the frequency of a given mode played within that session sequence. And so what you can see here is for this particular mode affinity cluster, um, in their first sequence, they played a lot of this mode in light purple, 50%, which is onboarding. Um, and then 20% of the time was spent in this melon mode. And so by their fifth session in the sequence, um, they were spending 70% of their time. So this helps you understand for this cluster of players, where did they come from? Um, what did their early experience look like? And then in terms of churn, we're looking for the black areas, right? So you could see here, there's a little bit of churn happening in their ninth session. So we could probably conclude that this mode isn't associated with churn. Um, same thing with this mode here. Um, this is fairly healthy. There's a small sliver of black here, but not a lot of churn happening. Okay, so now it gets interesting. Um, so if you look at the bottom right, you see here that, oh, okay. You see here that there's a little bit of early churn detected. So those players falling into this mode affinity cluster, that's something we need to look at. Uh, there's definitely something happening here um, with those playing like this mode in deep purple, um, and the light blue, there's early churn happening in the third session. So this doesn't necessarily imply that this is a bad mode and causing churn, but it is a data point for us to dig into deeper with research. Okay. All right, so those were the hardest topics. Um, okay, wait, I need a wine, sorry. Okay. So, um, you know, we can look at player data to see what they're doing in the game, but we don't know why, right? You, you can't figure out the why with player data alone. And so, um, in order to, to get a really good picture and better insights, we need to match the what with the why. Okay. Oh, sorry, I guess. My slides aren't following me, <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about an example that we did with competitive gaming. 
And you know, we wanted to know where the players were spending time in the game, and we wanted to be able to segment our players into different degrees of competitiveness. Um, but rather than just drawing arbitrary lines on where we define somebody as competitive with our behavioral data, we wanted to use survey data. Um, so allow our players to self-select in the survey data in terms of where they fall on that competitiveness spectrum. And then, let's see. So this is the methodology. Um, we started with survey questions, um, asking them about different motivations around competitiveness, and allowed um, the survey takers to classify themselves into the different competitiveness tiers. What we then did, and this is the cool part, is we, we used that as the baseline for our model, um, and then joined that with our in-game telemetry so that we can then classify all our players into the right competitiveness bucket. Okay, and so that, that allowed us to come up with these four segments. Um, you know, we've got our non-competitives, our casual competitives, our dedicated competitives, and professionals. And so um, what's cool about this is, you know, we can use this segmentation funnel to determine how our features and events impact shifts along this funnel. Um, for instance, uh, we can see if, oh, okay, is this, is this feature well received by our professionals? Um, maybe a feature that works for professionals doesn't work for our casual competitives. So we can, we can look at that. Um, you know, so it, it, it allows us to have a better idea of what to develop and how that resonates with these different segments. Okay, so, um, so we do know that, so this is a summary so far. So the patterns can tell us about the evolution of the player relationship. Um, it's helpful for design. We can use it to understand churn points and you know, it's powerful to combine the what and the why. Okay, so it's time for the second sports trivia and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask this properly. Okay, so does anybody play the journey in FIFA? Oh, okay. Okay, does, does anybody know where FIFA's Alex Hunter was born? No, I'll give you a hint. If you get the right country, you'll get it. No, it's, it's somewhere in Europe. Wait, what'd you say? No. No. Yes, who said that? <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, you said England? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. Oh, you said England? Okay. All right. Here you go. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's in Clapham, England. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so this is <laughs> this is the home stretch. So um, I thought it would be cool to apply this framework to my favorite mobile game, which is Dominations. Um, and so I was in a stage three relationship with another deep mobile title when an intriguing in-game ad popped up for Dominations, and I thought, oh, this is cool. I like history, um, and it's a strategy game on mobile. And so I installed the game, and the initial fare lasted about three days. I was trying to split my time between both games, but it was just getting impossible. Sometimes I was feeling guilted by pop-ups on my other game, but I eventually just moved over to Dominations, and that was it. So um, when we think about a mobile title, game mode doesn't really work, because you don't have different game modes in a mobile title, but you do have a lot of features. And so, um, have you, how many of you have played Dominations? Okay, all right. Well, you, you guys should play, because it's, I love it. It's like a strategy game on mobile, you could just pick it up. Um, it is a deep and immersive strategy experience where you can gather resources, uh, defend your nation, and conquer other nations to advance your civilization. 
And so there are a ton of features here. I probably didn't get all of them, but this is what we're going to use for the uh, feature affinity framework. And so um, this is my, this is kind of my evolution in the relationship with dominations. Um, in phase one, it was basically the game onboarding. It was really good guided onboarding. Um, this little guy just like kind of, you know, took me around the whole thing. And so my feature affinity in this phase would show a diversity of features. Um, and that's good because I got exposure to the core loop and eventually moved me over to phase two. So now we're in phase two. Um, so here, basically, um, you know, I got out of the tutorial and I was out on my own, but I had a, a fear of being attacked and losing all my stuff. So, you know, I bought a peace treaty, which kind of shields you from that, and spent a whole lot of time just strengthening my fortifications. And so my feature affinity would show a lot of time spent here, fortifications upgrade, um, resource gathering, as well as battles. But if you looked at this in combination with my win-loss rate and my coin balance, my um, currency balance, you would see that I was losing. Um, I had a low earn rate. I hit a paywall pretty quickly, and I was about to churn. But, you know, I thought this game was really cool, so I went on the forums um, and did some research and discovered that actually it's better to build up your offense. So at that point, I shifted, and I started focusing on building up my army. And so my feature affinity would show that I'm spending most of my time upgrading my army, resource gathering, and spending time in battles. And so, you know, uh, if you looked at my metrics, you would see my battle win rates increasing and my earn rate increasing as well. And so that got me back in the game. So now stage three of the relationship was interesting um, because as you start to progress, more and more features start to open up. And so at this point, um, it was interesting for me as a gamer because I'm in analytics, I started thinking about my motivations. And so the way that the features are laid out, there's three types of motivations I was seeing. So one was around reward seeking. Um, and that's, that's where I fell into, because I found I was doing all the objectives, the challenges, the live events, because I just wanted more stuff. Um, and then there's a second grouping around social affiliation. So these are the folks who are participating in things like leagues and world wars and embassies. So world wars, it's kind of like risk. Um, if you've played risk, it, it allows you to participate in this gigantic war with other people. And embassy allows you to build coalitions to help in that. That wasn't for me. Um, and then the third motivation is around um, steady advancement. So these folks, they're about leveling up. When you participate in a battle, you have a choice between battling for stars or for resources. Stars is what allows you to level up. That, that wasn't me either. Um, and then advancing civilization. Um, that's also part of your steady advancer. They would save up their coins to advance the next civilization. I wasn't doing that either because I wanted to use my coins to boost my army. Um, so the result for me was that I had high engagement during live events, um, and then it would wane in between. So here, what you might think about doing is um, knowing that this is my motivation based on my affinity behavior, um, put something in between the live events to keep me engaged that appeals to my reward-seeking motivation. Okay, so, and this is the final wrap-up. Um, know where you are in your relationship. Use this affinity framework or whatever else you have to understand where players are spending time and what that quality time looks like. And then lastly, I do want to say data isn't the be-all, end-all. I know for an analytics team, you know, it's maybe, maybe it is, but um, it's only one facet of understanding the player relationship. And, you know, good intuition, um, good design, as well as making sure you understand and listen to the voice of the player, those are all the data points you need to put together to really build that healthy relationship. 
All right, we're done. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions? Yep. You, uh, there's a lot of different um, ways of playing the game, all these game modes. Do you feel like adding all these game modes um, increased your audience or, or did it split your audience too much so that you experienced churn in certain modes uh, of game? Hmm. That's a tough question. Um, yeah, so in some cases we did see some splitting, right? So like there was, you know, there's your, your group who loves to play your core modes um, that are pretty deep. And then, you know, you have another group that's more casual playing your PVE type modes. Um, I, I do think there is a realization that um, we, we should, rather than just continue to add and add new modes, we should think about how all the modes work together. Um, so I can't say whether, you know, the addition of new modes led to people leaving, but what does happen is when, you know, you don't focus on making parts of your mode better, people will leave, right? Especially if you don't innovate in your modes. Okay. Yep. Colleen, can you talk about a time that the data led you to a wrong conclusion, how you recognized that and what you did to fix it? Wow. <laughs> Sorry. That's the one. <laughs> Wow, um, how a data led to the wrong conclusion. Can I come back to that one? Yeah, totally. Okay. <laughs> oh, can, yeah, I can ask? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question about uh, pro players or dedicated ones. Do you pay uh, much attention to feedback that they give you, like we want these features and this and this, or you're just try to rely on the real data, not big data? It's a balance. Um, so we do have a group called the Game Changers, um, and those are our core players who come in and give us feedback about the game. Uh, so we do take their feedback into account since they represent um, our core very engaged players. Um, but we also balance that with data, right? So I think a good system is you, you, know, you take the feedback from your core players to generate some ideas on how to improve the game, and then you test that through play testing. Mm. Um, and then you know, once your features launch, then that's where you use the power of big data and analytics to validate um, the hypothesis around those features. Okay, I get it, thanks. Is there any other questions? I know, I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, okay. With games on an annual release cycle, uh, does it, how do you deal with the fact that it would take a long time for you to act on the data? Do you do a lot of mid-cycle changes? I wouldn't think so. Uh, well, so um, when we prioritize what projects we work on, one of the, the dimensions we look at is the timing of action, of actionability. Um, and so there are some things that are quick turnaround, um, for instance, live service. So new content, new programs. Uh, those are things with a quick turnaround required. And so those, those projects will be simpler. Right, so that's how we get those in. Um, and then, you know, we have live services, which is on one cadence. We also have the annual release cycle. And so for that, there are deadlines, right? Uh, a window of opportunity for, for data to have an impact. And so, you know, we'll prioritize the questions that we get to hit those deadlines. So we call that gate two, and that's when your features need to lock. Um, and so there, there are timelines, and if we don't hit those timelines, then you know, the decisions will get made without the data. 
Did, does that answer your question? Okay. okay. Any other question? So maybe we can go back to okay. the first one. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. Well, uh, I could think about a time when there was a business hypothesis that was going around. Um, it was basically about cannibalization, and it's kind of closely linked to the, one of the Sankey diagrams that I was showing earlier. Um, so there was, there was a year when we put a lot of investment into A mode, and then one of the other modes started losing engagement. And so literally everybody had a hypothesis that, oh, that, that mode where we put a lot of investment in, that cannibalized, right? Um, we were actually able to show with this data that that wasn't the case, um, and that that drop in engagement was due to something else in terms of a feature decision that was made. Sorry, I know that's not... Um, Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that they are appreciating the power of data combined with their intuition? Um, yeah, so uh, the way we do that is, um, you know, we, we hold their hand through that process. Um, so, you know, we get, we get the hypothesis together. Um, we, you know, got this data together. And then um, you pretty much, it's all about socializing. And so we socialize that all the way from like the designer all the way up to the, the EP and the GMs of the studio. Um, and then from there, you know, it, it kind of lays a foundation and trust um, for us to work with our partners in the studio to, you know, like think twice before jumping to the wrong conclusions. <laughs> yep. Uh, so my questions will have two parts. Uh, first okay. part, uh, I would like to ask you about, for example, if we take FIFA series. Uh, you have like, I don't know from which year did FIFA start, like 90s. And do you analyze the behavior of uh, your players, be like which are passing from FIFA 2011 to 2012, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Do you have such traction and do you analyze them because you show you within one product? life cycle, mm -hmm. but do you analyze uh, the guys who are with you for five iterations or so well? Yes, yes, we do. Um, it's interesting because uh, in that way we find that there are players who've been with us for five plus years, right? And the reason why we do that is because those players are coming into your game with a different point of view than those players who are coming in brand new to that cycle. So we're in FIFA 19 now. Somebody who's coming into FIFA 19 for the first time has a much different perspective than somebody who's been playing since 09. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a long time. Maybe FIFA 12. <laughs> yep. And do you see backwards traction? For example, they come to FIFA 19 and then they get back to 18 and stay there. Um, yeah, so sometimes we do see that. Uh, and that's because, you know, we still have people probably playing on 17. Um, you know, the games are still out there, and so, um, yeah, so people will, s will still do that, yep. And one more question, uh, so you have much wider portfolio of the, game, of the games, even within EA Sports, like Madden, NHL, NBA, et cetera, et cetera. So do you track this, like, do you do this portfolio management analytics and see how they uh, rotate from game to game? Mm hmm Yes, yes, we do do that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of affinity between the games. Um, you know, there's also affinity between sports titles and titles outside of sports. Um, so, for instance, you know, Madden is a strategy game, and so we may see some affinity between Madden and another title in EA that has a strategy element to it. Mm -hmm. And on, on top of that, do you have mm -hmm. any kind of uh, strategy of movement of players from one title to another inside your own, uh, like, shop or whatever? Oh, uh, I don't know if I could talk about that. 
<laughs> Sorry. Yes, they do. No, I don't. I'm not saying that. I just can't talk about it. Like a splash screen, like a big one. Yep. Uh huh. I'm sorry. How much direct access do your de uh, developers, your creative team, have to the data that you're actually collecting? Does it all go through you guys, or do you mm -hmm. have think ways where they can actually go in directly and start looking at some of the behaviors that they're interested in? Oh, yeah. Um, so they definitely have access to dashboards, um, and some of those dashboards are pretty detailed. Um, so metrics by segments and things like that. Um, we don't have a whole lot of people outside of analytics who dive into the same type of data that we do, but there are folks who will dive into other areas like live service operations, right? To look at things like, um, you know, crash rates and desyncs and things like that. Um, so those folks will have direct access. This Hello, yep. thank you. Hi. Uh, you talk about the segments a couple of times, right? Uh, and during your presentation, you emphasize behavioral patterns. Uh, I'm not sure if you may answer my question. Does your segmentation include only behavioral patterns, gameplay patterns, or there is some monetization inside too? Um, I think I would say, huh, yeah, we do. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry? Thank you. I, I think every, every game company does that, right? <laughs> OK. Right. I know, it's, it's a dirty word, and we don't like talking about it, but. Thank you. Yep. OK. Uh, is there any other question? I think we are out of time already. <laughs> it's, uh, so uh, I would like to ask you for a big applause for uh, oh, Colleen. Thanks. <laughs>